good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the HIT Procurement Implementation Web Conference. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, and later we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. If anyone should require audio assistance during the conference, please press star and then zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference, Mr. Mike Scarano. Mr. Scarano, you may begin. Good morning, or for those of you in the East, good afternoon. And welcome to the first segment of Foley and Lardner's four-part health information technology series. Today's program is called uh, Health Information Technology Procurement and Implementation, a Strategic Approach. And we have two great, very experienced speakers to uh, lead us through this topic. Um, the first one is my partner, Jim Kalivas, who is the founding chair of Foley's Information Technology and Outsourcing Practice. Uh, Jim's been negotiating health information technology and other IT transactions for more than 20 years, and he's worked on literally billions of dollars uh, in, in deals. And Jim is based in our Los Angeles office. Our second speaker is Tim Moore, who is Senior Vice President and CIO of the highly respected Hogue Health System, a, a multi-hospital system in Orange County, California. Um, before coming to Hogue, uh, Tim was Executive Director for Provider uh, Healthcare at uh, Pro Systems, uh, now part of Dell, uh, and prior to that, he was um, in charge of uh, information technology at the Carondelet Health System, and so Tim has been on both sides of the table. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Mike, and, th and thanks to all of you for participating today. Um, we're going to try to focus on some elements of uh, IT procurement in the, in the healthcare uh, space that, that might be a little different, hopefully, than things that you've heard before, um, and primarily talk about strategy and business objectives and tying those to the procurement effort, um, vendor selection approaches, and then key project issues. So we'll start with something that's actually quite basic, and, and some of you may say, why are we talking about this? But um, connecting the procurement to your strategy and business objectives is a really, really important aspect of any um, HIT procurement. And I can tell you from experience, I ask this question of my clients all the time. I say, what are your business objectives for this? And it, it more often than not takes people aback, and they have to sit back and think about it. And that's exactly the response I want in the sense that I want the clients and I want any buyer of healthcare technology to understand what are they doing, what, what is its main business objective. And the entire process, I think, needs to be geared toward attaining that objective. And you'll see down here, you know, um, just some concepts, these transformation, other business objectives, some or all of these are probably on top of mind for almost everybody participating in this conference. Um, but, um, and, and Tim, I know that, that we've had experience, and I know that it's the, the way you approach these things, but, um, you know, can, can you talk a little bit about the difference between buying components and buying a business solution? Yeah, there's, there's definitely, well, first of all, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. There's certainly a difference in that, and you'll drive different outcomes. When you are buying a component, generally speaking, um, you are shorting the business on what you really are seeking when you go after an electronic health record, if you will. Um, the, when you're buying a solution or a complete suite system solution and package, what you're looking for is the opportunity to tie all of the pieces and parts to your strategy in a comprehensive way that ultimately, at the end of the day, when you check down why did we do this, we've achieved it, and, and it's a big difference, and I hope as we transition through the slides today, we'll be able to elucidate that a bit. Yeah, thanks, Tim, and, and I think the other really um, huge element of this is it helps the business, it, it helps your executives and the rest of the organization understand why this particular expense is important and, and why they need to get behind it um, from an organizational perspective. Uh, one thing that we were hearing a lot of is, well, we're doing this because we want to, you know, we want to make sure we meet meaningful use and and uh, get our incentive payments, and and that's 
you know, obviously a legitimate, very legitimate thing, but it's not a strategy in, in, in our view, and, and it can be very short-sighted um, to just be diving into this because you need, you, you know, you need to go there. Um, there are too many, as all of you on this line probably know, there's just too many implications um, to a project of this magnitude to just say, well, w we've got to move fast because we need to get this money now. I, I, I totally understand that, but um, having a bad EHR strategy, having the wrong system, and not being prepared internally to make it work um, could actually have a bigger a negative, bigger negative financial impact on you in the long term than the incentives that you might um, get. So I just just raise that as a as a point of consideration. Um, but other questions that you might ask, and, and Tim, uh, please jump in with some of the things that you look at. But you know, who are who are my business partners going to be downstream? Um, where is this data going to go? Who, who do I need? What data do I need? What data do I need to communicate? And with who um, am I going to be communicating about um, uh, communicating that information with? Um, who's going to need access to this technology, and how are they going to access it? And as we've been talking about, how do we align this um, acquisition with our strategies? Uh, Tim, thoughts in, in terms of some of these questions? Yeah, a couple of thoughts, and I'm actually I'm going to just for a brief second click back to that previous slide. And I, you, you have a bullet there, and it's the second bullet in the first paragraph, all vying for the same pool of vendor and other expert resources. I know that's probably talking down to this very informed audience and looking at our participants this morning, but I cannot stress that enough. Living in the trenches where I do, and uh, coming from the vendor side, as I have been in a couple of times in my career, as we talk about building a contract, we'll come back to this theme, but I would suggest to our audience that that is one of the most important items that a contract gets built around, and there are specifics that you're going to talk to a little bit later, but I just felt important to touch on that. Um, it, it will, it will uh, create you great success or... Uh, migraine size headaches if you don't manage that well. But the, these questions that, that you, you pose on, on the, this slide here, I, I guess what I would also add to this is to really understand what you're trying to accomplish and the audiences that you're trying to accomplish it for. You know, healthcare is one of those entities that we have an awful lot of masters. We, we have the folks that we exist to serve, and those are our patients, by and large, our patients. Sometimes they're just our customers because they're in our continuum of care. But then we have our board members. Oftentimes we have our community has regulations over us beyond the obvious. Then we have our internal operations, our external operations. And then really to shift what's happening in healthcare today that I think we all need to appreciate and I think we are appreciating is it's becoming uh, consumer driven and it's happening at the speed of light. And, and their involvement and how do they want to participate, and some of them are getting uh, pretty influential. Thanks, Tim. Um, so, you know, for, for these reasons, um, any uh, major procurement effort in this area, I think um, I, I learned uh, this phrase was uh, said to me years and years ago by a, a CIO at the end of his career. He always said, you know, be in a hurry to finish, not to start. And, and I think that that has rung true throughout my experiences on technology projects. It is that time and energy you put up front in understanding what you want to achieve, um, how you're going to achieve it, understanding the resources that are needed, um, enlisting the um, level of executive buying and sponsorship uh, needed to be successful and, and, and forming the team needed to be successful. All of those steps up front are going to contribute greatly to the probability of success in achieving your ultimate business goals. And the theme that you've, you've heard Tim allude to and, and that I hope we, we leave you with is that, that this is all about achieving an end result at the back end um, and to, to, to um, ensure that you are structuring every aspect of the effort from the from the very beginning to achieve that result. Um, Tim, I, I, on communication in particular, 
Um, can you can you t- talk to us a little bit about that? Because I, I know sometimes people have front end um, support, but that seems to kind of wane and get lost over time. How how do you avoid that? Yeah. So boy, is that an important element? And and these are longitudinal projects, oftentimes uh, multi year. You know, for if you're a large and complex organization that many of our participants today are. You know, and with that, I, I will state it uh, kind of obvious that in, in many ways, obtaining the initial buy-in is the easy part. It's managing, mentoring, and continuing to groom uh, that buy-in through communications that often will mean the difference between a successful implementation at the end or not. And, and that has to be something that is owned. So it can't be kind of on, you know, we'll all take care of that. That has to have an owner. It has to have a cadence to it. It has to have an interval to it. It has to have a branding to it. And it needs to be taken as a cornerstone. Uh, and here's, you know, here's my reason why for that. You know, healthcare, we all know, and boy, if I've ever talked down to you this morning, this will do it. But as we know, it's moving very rapidly, very, very rapidly. And so what's important today is important today. And longitudinal projects such as these can very, very easily get lost, um, you know, because the next important thing that happened tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and if you're not careful, or you, as the champion of this project, if you're not careful, it didn't get any less important at all, but it gets lost in the mix of what we're transforming healthcare to. So um, have, that, have that focused commitment to communications. I would suggest that uh, one of your stakeholders has to be your communications and marketing department. It has to be your executive team. You have to share this. If this gets owned by any one part of the organization, if these are enterprise-wide, and uh, said, said another way, everybody gets to play. And, and I think that that, that next bullet also, Tim, kind of um, triggers off of what you just said, which is, you know, Ensuring that you're you're focusing this project on on what people who are critical to its success care about, um, particularly if it if it has a center in an IT um, uh, department or organization, um, you know you can't be successful without the clinicians, um, and and they don't you know they care about different things than than um, you may care about, and it's that ability to translate um, what you're trying to achieve from a technology um, and even a strategic objective to what they care about that's going to help um, facilitate success. Um, Again, Tim, any any thoughts on that before we... I would just add to that um, an example possibly. Um, so we all know something about meaningful use, some of us more than others, for sure. Um, but, but meaningful use in and of itself, if we were to use that as a business driver and we were to talk about it as meaningful use because you, there's these requirements now and we have the carrot and then we're going to get hit with a stick, you know, most people join health care at the delivery level, and it's, it's changed a little bit over the years. It's changed since when I first entered way back when. But it's still more true than false that they entered because there's a, there's a calling and a passion to do the right thing for the patients at the right time. And to do that, it needs to be efficient and effective and all those nice words. So you have to kind of break out things like meaningful use and you have to translate that. What's in there that helps with that? But if we, if, you know, where I've seen people just literally roll their eyes when you make the mistake of mentioning meaningful use as if it's the driver, um, you know, you, you have to tease that out and you have to say, well, let me talk about what about that. So, uh, you know, I'll leave it at that because I think we get a chance to talk a little bit more about it. But you do have to package this, communicate it, and frame it in a way that your stakeholders are going to buy in. If this gets viewed as an IT techie type thing, you might as well not start because you're done. So now we're going to talk a little bit about approaches to procurements and selection, vendor selection. Um, the, the, the focus of this is uh, 
more on the the private side uh, where you have a little bit more flexibility. Obviously, if you're a public entity, uh, you have a, a typically a, a, a number of um, laws and um, and policies that govern how you go about procurement. So you have to be attentive to those. But assuming that you have more flexibility, that here's here's a suite of approaches. Um, and, I, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of them, um, but, but we are going to focus a lot on this concept of directed procurement because um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a, a phrase I've been using for a number of years. It's probably not been in the press, may not be something that you've ever seen before, um, but I think you'll all understand it when we talk about it. But, but other approaches, obviously competitive negotiation where you literally go downstream uh, with, uh, you know, two vendors, um, you know, two or more vendors head-to-head -head negotiating um, and, and making, um, you know, getting real-time feedback about pricing um, and, and where they are in terms and conditions. Um, it's a very, very effective uh, approach. It's very time-consuming and resource-intensive. Um, many organizations don't have the bandwidth internally to truly go down a, a, a dual or multiple path negotiation. Um, I'm going to come back to directed procurement because we're going to spend a, a number of uh, slides on that. Um, oftentimes, you'll, you, the clients will um, do some preliminary RFP work and other selection efforts to get to a place where they maybe stout, start downstream with multiple vendors and then quickly um, decide which of those vendors um, really uh, th th that they feel they have the best opportunity to get to uh, a solution with that that works for them and then continue the negotiations with that single vendor um, until they um, you know provided that single vendor continues to be cooperative and they continue to make progress um, but the the important part about that is making sure that if you had a legitimate number two or number three alternative vendor, that you're honest and direct with them about where they are and how the process works so that they don't truly feel that they've, they've lost, but that they understand that it's kind of the other person's uh, deal to lose, but that you are truly prepared if the other person doesn't, uh, if the other vendor does not uh, participate um, and cooperate um, in a way that you think they should uh, to, to move back. Um, to, to one of these other vendors. That, that's important. Um, and the honesty with the vendors is important, too. There's, you know, there's really – the stakes are too big, and the investments that folks are making are very large, and, and there's very little room in my mind for, you know, stringing people along. Um, I don't feel that's a very effective strategy. I've never really seen it work very well. Um, and, and, frankly, the vendors are intelligent enough to know – uh, if there's a legitimate opportunity to succeed or not. Um, but, it, but, but that's bolstered by your honest communication with them. Um, then, of course, you could just quickly, based on the RFPs and without any kind of head-to-head -head, uh, competition, make a choice and move forward. You could sole source and just make a choice and move forward, or you could have a, a truly um, multi-vendor um, selection. My my concern and suggestion to you and what we're going to talk about in the directed procurement context is that there's a lot of energy that goes into these RFPs, um, both from your organization and from the vendors. If you do um, a truly, um, you know, uh, open RFP, you, you, you spend the time and energy to identify your requirements, what you need, throw it out there. There are a lot of new folks in the space right now, a lot of new vendors, a lot of people who will probably respond, and that means that your staff and your team is going to have to sort through um, many, many different proposals. Um, and my concern is that, you know, the more time you spend sorting through the five or six or ten um, that really don't um, – 10 proposals that really don't seem to, to address your needs, the less time you have to focus on what's really important to your organization. So um, the concept of directed procurement that I'm going to talk to you about is really designed to say, look, 
um, can we identify a handful of people, uh, vendors that may meet our need, and can we move this process from the traditional RFP to a very focused uh, inquiry that helps us differentiate between those three vendors for our organization? And what is it about each of them, and how do we penetrate into what they really will do for us and how they will really respond as an organization in getting us to our solution uh, rather than kind of checking boxes on a textbook um, RFP process. And, and my suggestion to you is that, again, in the, in the non-public space, um, making some choices up front, doing your, your homework and um, adding some intelligence to the process up front and focusing your effort, and we'll show you and talk about some ways to do that, can, can really, really uh, help you to get to a better place faster. Um, so, Tim, I mean, this is not something that a lot of people talk about or um, and maybe have not even done. You know, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I would just like to echo, you know, and I, I'll bet you everybody on the phone that's went through an RFP process, when they do the all-inclusive, everybody gets to, you know, you send it out and you, 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 you know, you cast too wide of net. First of all, you dilute your focus, and I would suggest it, it consumes time. Uh, that is very valuable. Uh, again, getting back with that theme about how quick our world is changing in healthcare, most of these initiatives have an urgency to them. Uh, so moments count, days count, months count. So when you get to the directed procurement, I firmly believe uh, in most cases, and I know you have exceptions and when it's not the case, this is the way it's going. And this is the way that's going to make you most efficient for not only narrowing it down, but it's the, and I don't mean this to sound uh, uh, improper, but it's the intelligence in which you, you form your procurement process and, and part of that that, I, you know, I thought about uh, last night in reviewing these slides is really what makes this really work? And in addition to what you have here, it requires that upfront work that you talk about. It's that pre-planning work. But that pre-planning work, I guess the subtlety there that isn't so subtle is you must have the right informed, educated team. And sometimes, and I'm, I'm, I'm nobody's salesperson, but sometimes that requires you to get your own uh, expertise that comes from consulting or whatever. Don't don't be shy to recognize I'm going to ground that I haven't been to before. I need some help with that before I engage in this process. Thanks, Tim. Um, it, and, and and I think where you can you know move with this is to um, take it. You know, one of the frustrations that I've had being on the other side and often reviewing proposals is all the effort that goes in the RFP, and then oftentimes um, there's just a lot of what sounds like marketing-related material that comes back um, where you haven't really um, – you, you don't really feel like you're getting to know the vendor um, and their capability for your particular project uh, very well. You just kind of have the marketing team spitting back materials um, to you. Um, and so what what I talk about when we do this is really coming up with some more open-ended, penetrating questions to the vendors um, to, to, to understand how they're really going to deliver on the project. Um, that does not mean, it does not mean that there is not um, the need for um, kind of the standard, you know, making sure that the core functionality is there, uh, but particularly in the EHR space right now, um, between, you know, ONC, ATCB uh, certification and then other requirements from some really strong organizations, you know, and I'll, I just picked one that I'm just familiar with, the CCHIT um, specific requirements on ambulatory and inpatient, um, you know, they – some of these organizations have spent a lot of time vetting, you know, what is it that you need in, a, in an EHR? And, um, and 
as a starting point, um, you know, you could probably contact CCHIT and be able to use their requirements in your in your RFP, um, assuming, you know, you can't just copy them, that, that wouldn't be appropriate, but, but as a starting point, you could, you could leverage that, and then your team can focus on how do those fit or not fit? What's unique about us? What are the special things that we need to do um, with our procurement? So that instead of exhausting the team in terms, in terms of recreating the wheel on what makes an EHR, start with something that's built, adapt it, and then focus your energies on how your procurement needs to be a little different. Um, so I'm going to skip over this slide for a second and come back to it because I want to get to this, to this, this question and answer thing is that, you know, um, we try to ask a series of questions, and here's an example on this slide, which is it, it, it requires the, um, the responding vendor to, to, to think. It, it requires them to demonstrate to you their intelligence and their solution. Um, and this would be just one of, a, of, of a quite a few questions that we would put in, but, you know, what are the most significant, what are the five most significant technical problems you encounter um, in connection with interfacing applications in, in a similar environment? How do you mitigate and avoid those issues? Um, understanding that in these common issues, what are you doing or what do you recommend be done to avoid those in the future? Um, trying to get true thought from the vendor about real life issues that you're going to encounter in your implementation. That enables you to truly make some differentiated judgments between vendor A, vendor B, and vendor C. It will also very, very clearly allow you to see if you've got an implementation team who's seriously considering your RFP, or if you've got a sales team that's responding um, with, with marketing proposals. Um, I'll just give you another, just one other in terms of the, co the questions. Uh, on, the, on slide 15 here, you'll see, you know, what are the typical challenges to implementing best practices that your software offers. You know, how do you address those challenges? And again, how have you thought about, um, you know, improving your processes um, and, and what would you do differently? These are questions that you don't typically see in an RFP and that, that proposers may not typically see. But the responses to these type of questions are extremely telling um, and, and I think really add value to your decision-making process in a way that a bunch of yes-nos on a bunch of requirements that many of the folks playing in the same space um, have somewhat similar um, responses to uh, doesn't do. But, but Tim, this is a little bit different. What, what are your thoughts on, on, on this approach? I absolutely, and I think saying it just maybe a little bit different to what you said, or maybe to to elaborate on it, it it, it will demonstrate to you both in their, their if you perform it in a written format, which is generally preferred for me anyhow, my my process uh, on the start, or and just in your contractual dialogue as you're trying to start this process. It truly assesses the depth of the organization for which you're dealing with, and it lets you know if they truly understand your business, first of all, have they done their homework, and it's one of my first questions when I sit down with a what I call solution providers is I ask them to tell me what they know about me right off the bat, and I have them spend a little time educating me what they know, because um, that's an expectation that they should have done their homework, and all quality organizations, as you know, do that. The next thing that you start wanting to know is, you know, how did they respond and to what depth did they respond and, and showing that, you know, kind of that intellectual uh, adjustment as to their standard as to who you are. So it gives you that piece. But here's the piece that I really get out of some of this, uh, Jim. Sometimes this is your first indication 
that you may or may not be dealing with the right people in the organization. You, you may be dealing with, I think you said earlier, the marketing, too much marketing, too much sales. And, and my, my clue for that is always, you know, uh, incomplete answers or I'll have to look into that or we're still researching that. Those should all be some color of flag or some color of light other than green. Um, so I, I absolutely believe this is, this is the type of thing that enriches the process that you put in that work up front that at the end, when you're starting to execute, you're going to get that predictable expected outcome. And, Tim, I know that when, when you do this type of approach, you've often even um, suggested you know, or developed within your team um, outlines for expected responses. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, exactly. Thank you for, for that little nudge. So uh, very much so that. So when, when, we, when we are asking for, you know, what we used to call a little bit of what, more of an open-end directed question. So I don't want to hear them just pontificate, but question requires a little more thought. It's not the yes and no as you've referenced. But I want my team, and, you know, for any of these complex type of deals, it's, it's a team. And if we're trying to do this alone, I would, I would suggest to our, our audience that I would ask them to rethink that. Um, but I, I have them go through and put together, you know, what is the theme of the right answer? And that ties back to your strategic initiative. Again, what are you trying to accomplish? So what kind of answers would we expect from that? And, and if you will, if you go back to, you know, more of, if you will, it's kind of an element of the RFP. The only way that I've ever got through the RFP type process is I had to have a pre-checklist of, did it, did it include this, did it include that, Give them a, put it on a Likert scale, one to five, how well did they answer that kind of thing. This is an embellishment, a refinement, and a much more valuable approach of that. But you do have to have, you know, your predefined, my, my position, you have to have your Predefine what answers are you looking for. Thanks. Um, so, and, and Tim already touched on this, and, and so we won't spend a lot of time. But, but the concept, again, about this directed procurement, but frankly, any of the procurement processes that you might choose to proceed with, is you know, the sooner you get the people who are going to be involved with your project involved, the better off you're going to be. Um, on, a, on a project of scale and size like an EHR, um, you know, or even, you know, ERP or, or, you know, billing systems, any of those types of projects, there is incredibly valuable exchanges that go on between the vendor and the organization during the um, selection and contract negotiation period. And it has always been a frustration to me that that entire process of commitments, promises, expectation setting goes on, and then that team from the vendor leaves, and then the implementation team shows up. And you've got a whole new set of folks that are kind of starting. And, and again, vendors deal with this differently. Not every vendor is the same. Some have very, very good approaches to doing this. But more often than not, you got a, a whole different crew coming in. And, um, and that whole exchange of, of what we're trying to do, how we're trying to accomplish, what the expectations are, can be lost. And I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right at all. And I don't think it's unfair for the customer to require that the people who are going to be involved in their project, at least some, you know, of the lead folks, are at the table when we're negotiating the deal. Um, let me, that, go on, go on, Tim. Let me, let me add something to this, Jim. So maybe for the first time this morning, uh, I'm going to talk from my previous life experience. So when I was a solution provider, and I think this really helps drive this point home, we learned very quick that when we brought the core team to the negotiations table, and oftentimes they were silent members and note takers, but they were introduced as what their roles were. It was almost always quoted as a differentiator when we were selected for the business. They said, we know who the team would be, 
We've got a chance to watch them in action. We've got a chance to meet with them on breaks. We, we know them. It's, it's building that relationship. Um, but in addition to that, it was always some version of this. We know that these are going to be our people, and they certainly weren't going to let you tell us wrong information. You were not going to oversell us because these are the same people that have to deliver it. So I think it's the inverse of what you're saying, but it really drives home how really important it is to have members of that team there. And if they can't do that, you should go back to what we talked about at the very beginning, and that is there's a finite number of these resources out there, and if they can't bring one to the table, you know that you're probably going to start in a hole with this project. So going through and kind of uh, building from what Tim just said and, and all these commitments, you know, a very important part, and you're going to see this um, downstream also, but a very important part of the procurement process is when you get agreement on something, don't don't rush through that agreement like, okay, if we talk about it, it's going to evaporate. Um, that is the worst thing you can do because no, you're dealing with, again, very intelligent folks on the other side. The best thing to do is to take that agreement and work it until it's at a place where it becomes meaningful and it, and it becomes a commitment because the worst thing to do is to have – um, great discussions during the negotiations, great discussions during the selection process feel very good. And then you get into the contract discussion, and all of a sudden, well, we, you know, we didn't see this language, or we didn't intend it like this, or, you know, we, we really didn't mean that. Um, that's really, really um, time-consuming, frustrating as can be for the, for the customers, um, and it's just counterproductive to the relationship. So kind of related to this, I think it's really, really important that in your initial procurement package, whether you're doing a full-on RFP or something that's a little bit more focused, you really do need to have the terms that you're expecting the vendor to agree to out there early. Uh, it makes very little sense to negotiate on price and solutions and strategies without any discussion about accountability, commitment, um, and, and, and how these things will be translated into your final agreement. Um, so, so you need not only to, to, to capture those little nuggets of agreement that happen along the way, but I would uh, go further and say that, you know, you, you need to bring the concept of what you're looking for in terms of commitment and contract terms uh, way up front in the process. Um, to just avoid the concept of, well, you know, our price or our solution center didn't contemplate this level of, of accountability or didn't contemplate the kind of warranty that you're talking about. These should become parts of the early discussion as, as much as price um, and, and technical solutions. Um, Tim, have you had experience with that in terms of the, the kind of the, the slippage issue and, and, and approaches to avoiding it? <laughs> have I had experience with the slippage issue? I'll just lie to everybody and say, no, never have. <laughs> um, no, absolutely, uh, the slippage issue and, and, and avoiding it is this, if you will, it's this tedious work. Um, I, I will tell you that it's one of the areas that I enjoy the least, um, just to be real honest about it. However, um, how it has saved me uh, innumerable uh, numbers of headaches, dollars, projects, and probably, to be very honest, probably kept me employed because of doing this hard work. This, this upfront piece is that, that you're making reference to is the example um, that, you know, it, 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 it allows you to have the foundation and it sends also a message, and I think we're going to get to this, and I, it's one of the areas that I have a little bit of passion around. It sends the message on, this is a formal process. Now, we all say we never want to go back and use a contract unless we need to, but there are elements of a contract we should absolutely go back and use, and it should be a living document that we're working off of throughout the process. But by building this, you, you make sure you, you're, again, tying back to your strategic initiatives 
And what you believed you had, you do have. It's in writing. And it just takes time uh, often. Uh, it, it's nobody's fun thing. Well, I'm sorry, Jim, I know this is what you live for, but uh, it's not fun for, for people like me, but it, it pays off and it's a necessary element and it's a cornerstone. Thanks, Jim. Um, so now we're just going to talk about a few practical uh, items and we're going to um, move through these uh, at, at a good good pace um, and we will be done as, as uh, planned at uh, um, you know, uh, 15 after the hour. Um, but um, the existing and new agreements, um, you know, whether you already have your key EHR, for instance, in, in, in place or not, or whether you're negotiating, um, you know, you're going to want to make sure you have some um, ex uh, specific acceptance criteria tied to meaningful use, um, making sure that you have the capabilities to deliver stage one objectives and, and, and to, to meet the achievement of the, of the measures. Um, and, and you're going to want to try to obtain ongoing commitments to assist um, with, uh, you know, stage two and stage three as those are defined. Um, you know, this is an iterative process and you're making a big investment now um, and you need to have a vendor who's in it with you, understanding that we're all flying a little blind with some of the um, requirements that we're gonna we're gonna have to achieve, but that um, you know you expect once you you throw in with a vendor on their system that they're with you in this process, um, and that it's not going to cost you um, at every step of the way um, uh, as you go there. Um, Key issues we talked about earlier, you know, you've got, um, I, I think that the, you know, um, uh, high-tech incentives are clearly going, to, you know, it's just the, the number of projects being started is just, is huge. Um, so they're, they're working in terms of moving people toward EHR. Um, the question is, you know, who's out there to put it in? I mean, in the best of times, anybody who's been doing this for a long time knows that in the best of times, getting the right team was one of the most critical aspects of your system implementation. Um, and and it, in the best of times, there wasn't nearly the activity that's going on right now. Uh, there weren't the number of new entrants, um, and even the more established vendors um, didn't have as many different projects as they were working on. And, um, you know, certainly everybody has been working on building scale to, to address these issues. But the, the staff, I don't think, has ever been more important uh, to the success of implementation and securing the right staff um, has never been more important than it is now. And that's why we're going to spend, uh, you know, a, 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 a good chunk of time right now on that. Um, and one of the things that we, we – would suggest um, is that you take it um, much more seriously. Now, not that people didn't take it seriously before, but you know where you might have just interviewed a project manager and maybe a couple other top level folks. You know, maybe now is the time to be interviewing everybody who's going to be in charge of a module um, and driving down a little bit further in terms of who are the people that the vendor is bringing to the table that are, are responsible for your success. Um, think of it this way. If you were doing it internally, if you had the capability, which most obviously do not, but if you were, would you put somebody in charge of a whole module, an important um, you know, component of your system, if you didn't have a real strong confidence in their ability both as a leader and their substantive uh, knowledge and, and other characteristics, you wouldn't, and, and so we're suggesting that that you clearly understand who these folks are, that you'd make specific accommodations in your agreement to lock down the right folks to the extent you can, so that they can't be switched out um, at the at the at the uh, uh, instance of, of the vendor, except in some very very specific circumstances. Um, and that you overall require the vendor to commit to um, staff continuity on the project. Um, it, it, there is probably nothing that I have seen 
that's more disruptive to projects than either the wrong people or the switching out of people on an ongoing basis. The, the, the um, impact on the, on the customer, on, on my clients, of having to help ramp somebody new up to speed on a project and then going through the same stuff that they've been through, um, both in terms of time and cost, is, is huge. Um, but Tim, I mean, uh, your thoughts on, 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 on the issue of staff continuity and your experiences? So let, let me give you a, a few different. So this is one of those areas I said I have great passion about because you, you've kind of said it. This, this will make or break your project, assuming you've picked the right, uh, you know, product solution and you've done the right, you know, homework and you've got your strategic alignment. You have all those things perfect. I mean, it's textbook. You, 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 you're now on the cover of whatever magazine because of your perfection there. But if you don't manage this component, if we don't manage this component appropriately, you're done. And so I give you a couple of things to, for us to all think about. Um, and you kind of said, if I'm going to say it another way, and, and I, I hope it's helpful, these people should be interviewed at least as thoroughly as you would interview somebody if you were going to hire them on your staff to do this job. And I would tell you then they should also be treated, if they've come on board, they should be tr treated with the same respect, absolutely, but also the same rigor and accountabilities as you would hold your own high-performing staff to. Now, then the language in here, I, I will tell you uh, in my prior life, again, uh, one of the things that uh, I would do once in a while, um, and I, it was never easy. It always took lots of work, but I will tell you they became our cornerstones for the business. They were our most successful relationships. And that is um, we would definitely define the key personnel. We, now I'm talking now, I'm now the vendor, all right? So we would, we would bring, to the, you know, these people to the table. We would define them. We would suggest, and we often got negotiated to places beyond our comfort because um, we looked at the big picture. So I'm trying to tell you we'll go further. Don't, don't be afraid to ask. Um, but we would, we would do all the penalties and such. But here's the one thing that we did. That we always, I was always looking for a way to make my accounts, the things I were responsible for, more successful. And what we would do oftentimes is we would get into a dialogue about retention of staff. And we would get into a dialogue about incenting the retention of that staff. And we would actually bake that into the contract. And what that did is we were able to actually, and we would, we would negotiate this in, but at the end of the day, we would, we would put a lever in there, oftentimes a dollar lever, for employees to want to be part of that deal. And it gave us that continuity. I've had the other side. I've inherited some deals where I didn't have that continuity, or I've had staff that I had you know, little ability to do something with, you know, and I'm talking now vendor staff. Um, you know, I, I know I'm talking down to the group here, but I, I hope you can tell from the, the inflection of my voice that I've lived on both sides of this. If you if you tie this down, you make it a requirement, understand how important it is, it will be your success. Thanks, Tim. And, and, and here, you know, again, um, just some additional um, provisions or considerations for you as they relate to staff, um, <coughs> again, probably more important than ever is getting a sense of the training that the, the, the rest of the team, not the managers, but the rest of the team has had. How many people on, on, the, on the implementation team from the vendor have multiple experiences uh, implementing the product in organizations of your type and size? What is the, the training program that the, the vendor puts in place to ensure that its people really can um, deliver and understand and that they're not learning on your job? Um, those, are, those are important things to be looking at um, today. Um, what we talked Tim about – go on, Tim. I'm sorry, Jim. I talked over you, but 
the other one on your list there is it's, it's, it's very appropriate to ask what has been their turnover and ask them to demonstrate it. Yeah, and, and I, what Tim is suggesting again, one of the things is, oh, it's not a you know a, a specific bullet here, but you know one of the you know the best predictors, right, of future performance is past performance, and 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 don't forget that concept throughout your procurement. Talk to people. Um, don't listen for what you want to hear when you're doing um, reference checks. Um, listen for what people are saying. Um, it's very, very infrequent that somebody comes right out and says, this is the wrong person. Uh, I wouldn't do it again. Um, but if you listen closely, you'll know when there's an area that you need to penetrate uh, a little further and when somebody is trying to um, uh, professionally and appropriately send you a signal. Um, many times um, in the procurement process, you see people uh, literally doing reference checks as a, as a way of uh, checking the box, right? We did it, yes. You know, don't look at it that way. It's, it's probably one of the most important um, elements of the whole process, and you can learn a ton because most of your colleagues want to help. Most of your colleagues want to help you to avoid issues that they've encountered. So keep an ear open when you're, when you're doing those, and don't just um, take it as something that you have to get through to move the process forward. Um, so, so we move on. When now we've got a team, um, and, and we're starting to figure out how how are we going to you know keep this team moving, and we've got some folks locked down. The concept of project milestone development and management is is uh, in my view a, a cornerstone to an effective implementation. Um, tying payment to delivery, tying payment to performance. Is, is just a must, and there are lots of reasons that you're going to hear from vendors why they can't do it. You need to make sure that delivery is um, it, it, it ha has a direct financial connection for the vendor because, because their organization will be designed around ensuring that they hit their targets in terms of getting paid. Um, again, I'm not trying, you know, there are some great vendors that will bend over backwards to help you just because that's who they are and that's what they do. So I'm not saying it's all motivated by money, but I am saying it's mostly motivated by the dollars. And the, you, you need to tie those dollars to delivery. You need to figure out there's all kinds of ways to do it. There is no single one way to do it. But I like to see some significant milestones that are, are identified, some significant dollars tied to achieving those milestones. I like to ensure that up front, the objective measures for determining whether or not that milestone has been met are defined and agreed to by both the, the client and the, and, and the vendor. Um, and that there's a concept that you don't, you know, you don't hit a next milestone until you've you know, finished on the first one, right? You know, we don't want people kind of um, dragging on and, and, and moving uh, moving resources from the first milestone to the second, so that they hit that. So there's there's got to be a lot of thought into put into it, but um, don't overthink it. Don't make it so that you're um, the only thing your project team is doing is is looking at milestones and 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 uh, and, and testing and and. Uh, uh, at, at a micro level that doesn't make sense for the project, but do give it thought about, you know, this is where we need to be at this time and when we're here and it's demonstrated we're here, this is when you're going to get money. Um, that works. I've seen it work time and again. Um, and, uh, and I don't, Tim, have you, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that, that kind of approach? So I won't even uh, entertain a contract of, of any meaning without a milestone-based concept where it is tied to payment and often, you know, penalty. Um, I absolutely agree with the sequencing, um, and there's lots of reasons that uh, I would suggest. And one of those, the sequencing, and what I mean by sequencing is, if you're I'm making this very simple, if you have four milestones and they've done one, they haven't done two. 
my view of the world is you don't allow them to go to three um, because at some point you've got to assess what happened in two. And worst case scenario, if you need to do a remediation or a back out or such, you've put yourself in a, in a much more difficult situation if you have proliferated out whatever you're doing further without managing the problem. If you can't resolve that problem, and it's, you know, obviously if you put it as a milestone, it was something very important, you're going to set yourself to a great risk. I would also just suggest here, um, and this comes from both sides, and, and this is uh, uh, having been faced with it as the solutions provider and being the enforcer of it as now the customer, and that is being um, appropriately aggressive. And, I, and it's the right word for me, it's aggressive in holding the vendor to the fire and do it early, set the tone, set the expectation, be, a, a, you know, I would just tell you be almost, um, you know, myopic in your, your ability to see nothing else other than are you performing or are you not? You know, and each one of those elements, and if not, require it to be rectified. Um, and do not let that build up. I think those are really good points, Tim. Um, you know, we talk, and I think we talk about it a little bit further on, but but um, every project, uh, I call it the cadence of compliance. Every project takes on a cadence, and it's um, up to you at the outset to establish what that cadence is. And, and the cadence is either, oops, it doesn't matter what we agree to in the contract, we're just going to um, work this out along the way, or it doesn't matter what the project plan dates are, um, when we miss it, we just adjust, or it's going to be, look, this is what we agreed to, this is what we're going to do, unless we go through a process and we both determine that for some reason it doesn't fit anymore, and then we'll make the appropriate adjustment but we're going to make it formally and we're going to make it correctly. So that cadence that Tim was talking about, a compliance, that, that concept of, 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 you know, not putting this stuff together and then filing. If I, the, I guess the one phrase I hear most often from vendors that, that uh, makes my back hair stand up is, oh, you know, uh, the, the whole point of the contract is just to get through it and then put it in the drawer and never look at it again. Um, you know, Maybe it's because it's how I make my living, but um, if you're putting together a project plan, a statement of work, um, and you have commitments and you're not looking at it and managing it aggressively, I think you're making a big mistake in terms of moving your project forward towards toward success. Um, so to that end, um, one of the things that I've observed uh, – you know, time and again is, you know, you, you just don't have necessarily the resources internally. Um, and there's a real desire to want to believe that the vendor team will really do the management that you need on the uh, deal to bring it home the way you expect. And I, and I sorry to say it, just, that's just wrong. Um, if you don't have, in my view, uh, either internal or, or external resources that are dedicated to you and to your management and, and oversight of the agreement, I think you've under-resourced the project, especially on a large project. And, it, and it's going to come back and it's going to have issues for you. Um, and that doesn't mean that you don't have very, very high expectations of the vendor for managing the project, but there needs to be someone on your end who is accountable to you um, that, 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 that's keeping an eye on all these moving parts. Um, and Tim, I know you've had experience with this. How, how do you handle that? So, yeah, that, this is to me, again, it's an execution success factor. Um, and first of all, I tend to believe by the time I've signed a contract uh, with my solutions provider, that they are, in fact, really good people, and they really are going to deliver what they commit to. But at the end of the day, you know, they are fiscally driven. They, these, are, these are not altruistic uh, adventures for these companies. And, you know, 
they are going to provide, you know, very good, often excellent uh, project, project and program management. But in healthcare, project management is a relatively new adaptation. It's growing leaps and bounds, and probably most of the folks on the phone are now utilizing them. But this resource, having your internal, ideally, that's my view of the world, somebody that has actually badged your employee, ideally, but if not, independent and solely independent from the solutions provider, the vendor, having a, you know, a project management office, it will absolutely pay for itself multiple times over. Their ability to track complex longitudinal projects, report on them, drive the appropriate teams and team members and uh, uh, participating entities. Oftentimes these involve more than just the primary, uh, you know, party and then the, the, the health organization and often a dozen others that are involved in it, companies that are involved in it, and to keep all of that together and moving forward. Old school was, gosh, that's kind of an applications process. Let's give that to our director of applications or maybe in a larger organization, the VP of applications. They should certainly have skin in the game and they should be absolutely hooked at the hip. But if, if you don't choose, my, my position on this, if you don't choose to put a project or depending on if this is a program, manager in charge of this where it is their day job to wake up in the morning, think about it, and go to bed at night thinking about it, um, your, you know, your chances of, again, executing to your strategic objectives are diminished. There's just too many variables going on in the day, and this, this will take second and third consideration, and you're going to put yourself at risk for slips or missed delivery and or you're just not having that cadence of accountability that you want. Uh, th thanks, Jim. And I think that that probably uh, addresses a lot of what we just uh, this next uh, this next slide we're on about aggressively managing the project and risk. The the one point on this that I, I just would want to reiterate, and Tim Tim mentioned it earlier, um, but don't let your issues accumulate. Um, I have been in issue resolution discussions time and again where people have been dutifully logging the problems, have been having meetings, but there's been no resolution, no resolution plan, no accountability toward resolution. And as the project progresses, these issues just kind of snowball and then newer issues um, are, are layered on top. And what happens is instead of addressing things in a, in a uh, aggressive and time appropriate way, they just pile up to the place where it creates a project crisis and necessitates some kind of resolution to simply move the project forward that may or may not address and typically doesn't address all of the problems that have been identified. Um, and that's part of the, the um, need to stay on top of those things as they as they arise. Um, I mean, we're going to go quickly through a few other slides and then uh, open it up for questions. We'll probably try to get there in the next five minutes uh, through the through the rest of the slides and then take your questions. Um, rethinking limitation of liability. I, I just you know I, I want to talk. I'm not going to spend time on on the actual slides here, but the point is when you're looking at your CEO and you're accountable to the organization for delivery, and you've got this really, you know, well-thought-out project, a lot of documents, a good contract, good project plan, but at the end of the day, the vendor doesn't have enough accountability to make failure painful on their end. Have you really delivered the appropriate level of protection to your organization? If the cost of delivering the result that was promised outweighs the exposure that the vendor has to your organization, are you at risk of them making a business decision 
that it is better to walk away or force some compromise that you don't want to make than to deliver. And the limitation of liability is where the rubber hits the road on that. Because that's where they say what their exposure is going to be and what their exposure is going to be in, very, in, in a number of different areas. And I know that you're all used to a certain approach, and I know that you're all used to seeing um, that, you know, there are limits and, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an acceptance out there uh, in the marketplace that some predictability about what the exposure to the vendor is is, is, is needed. I get it. But that number should be big. That number should be big enough to, to cause the executives in the vendor uh, organization to say, make it happen. Get it done. I don't want to have this exposure. So uh, uh, enough said from me on limitation liability. Tim, do uh, you have views on, on, um, on that issue? Yeah, um, from, from both sides, Jim, so from both sides of my working life. So I think you said it. Uh, the vendors always have a, a long reasons of, you know, why that can't happen and, you know, what it means to them and so on and so forth. This is one of those areas that it, it, it becomes a gut check in many ways for both organizations. And I like the way you kind of said, you know, are you really protecting your organization? You know, if there's not enough in that liability for them, for the solutions provider, if there's not enough there, at the end of the day, they have to make business decisions too. Their reputation is always worth an awful lot. But sometimes they have to make business decisions. And the time you spend to, you know, try to get some carve-outs in this area and ramp it up where they feel uncomfortable, uh, it pays for itself. I, I've, used, I've had to go to it a few times, and the fact that it's there, that we, you know, if you will, the fact that you're not the cookie cutter, in fact, you are a little different than the rest of their portfolio of agreements, oftentimes, more oftentimes, instead of going there, you never even get close to it because they don't want to touch that exposure. Thanks, Tim. And, and um, I'm going to conclude here real quickly. That you know, Warranties, I'd like to see you consider getting warranties that the software has the capabilities uh, needed to get you um, through to meaningful use and, and hit the um, objectives and quality measures that you need. And I'd like to make sure that you get some protection that this will happen on an ongoing basis um, and that you will get some ongoing assistance in, in, in achieving meaningful use as it's further de de um, defined. Um, and now we, we just get to some questions. Um, you know, thank you all for hanging in there. A, a huge chunk of you stayed in through the entire presentation, and I uh, appreciate that. Do you, anybody have any questions for uh, Tim or I? Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions at this time, you may press star and then one on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, you may press the pound key. One moment while we wait for questions. I am showing no questions at this time. Okay, well, it sounds like we may have covered the ground, hopefully, for you. Um, there are a couple things. Mike, do you want to, um, while well, people think, and uh, do you want to go over the, the next uh, segments of this program and, uh, you know, uh, the timing? Sure. We've got three additional uh, programs coming up, uh, one on November 18th, which is key legal issues raised by electronic health records, where we'll get uh, more into the weeds of some of the more important issues that you face uh, in connection with uh, procuring those systems. On December 16th, our program is entitled Privacy and Security in the High-Tech Era, and hopefully we'll have some regulations by then, but whether we do or not, we'll um, talk quite a bit about um, the privacy and security challenges that we all face. And then on January 23rd, uh, Emerging Issues in Health Information Technology. And we, we've got a, a noted uh, healthcare futurist uh, who's going to be on that program, John Hamalka, and uh, other great speakers, and we're going to cover emerging issues raised by wireless medical devices and uh, personal health records and other cutting-edge issues. So uh, look for our further um, announcements on these programs, and, and hopefully you'll sign up, and we appreciate you uh, attending today's program. 
you were going to send out some materials to the attendees, is that right? We are going to send out some materials. Um, we've got uh, a checklist of electronic health record issues and um, also uh, a, a document entitled Key Strategies for Implementing and Updating EHRs. And those are very uh, helpful user-friendly resources that, um, that uh, Jim and his team have developed, and I think you'll find them helpful. Great. So, so that will uh, we'll close the program. Yeah, the, um, hearing no questions, uh, thank you all for your uh, kind attention to, to these issues, and, and uh, good luck with your efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude your conference. You all may disconnect, and have a good day.